I remain hopeful. I especially remain hopeful of our younger people mm. and I remain hopeful of indigenous people and our kind of leadership and what that will mean in terms of its value to the world, mm. which I think is only now coming to the fore. I remain hopeful that we will have you know, political leaders who truly believe you know, in the depths of their soul about the importance of humanity going forward. Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Dame Cindy Kiddo, Governor-General of Aotearoa, New Zealand, born in Whangare, raised in South Auckland and in West Auckland, now holder of the highest office in New Zealand, the Head of State for our country. She was appointed in October 2021 and now is on the international stage, leading to engagements with kings and queens, heads of governments, and even an interesting conversation with Elon Musk. But this girl from Tatai Tokero, graduated through university, the former children's commissioner, a former CEO and researcher, represents us to the world. This is her story. Dame Cindy Kiro, Governor General of the country on Indigenous 100. Your Excellency, at the Kawana Tiana Late Nakwe. Julian. No, my. No, my. Thank you for being a part of our program, Indigenous 100. Let me ask the most obvious question first. Okay. Why did you agree to do this interview? <laughs> <laughs> of all the interviews you could do in the world, <laughs> Why do this one? It's pretty simple, really. <laughs> it's because of you. <laughs> and that is the honest answer. I agreed because you asked. And I have a lot of faith in you as an interviewer to ask tough but honest and also questions of integrity. And, um, you know, to try and understand what motivates people, try and understand what's behind an issue. And I've always valued that in you as a journalist, in you as a broadcaster, but also I valued it in other Māori journalists in particular. I saw this in Shane Tauruma, I saw it in Mikey, you know, I see it in our people who are in broadcasting and I have value that. I think it's actually important. So when you asked, I have an official secretary who told me <laughs> and uh, she said, I thought you might be inclined and I said, I am, I'll say yes. He's asked me, and I think it's important, so I'll do it. So, okay. Queena. I appreciate that. Can I, and I, can I clarify, for the benefit of the, the audience, it's not because we're related either, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely to be related, but, um, and I'm so honoured, actually, when people claim me. Mm. And I have to say, more and more people are calling me auntie than I ever <laughs> thought I'd hear. But I see that as a sign of respect, you know, the desire that people have to connect mm. and to claim kinship. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good sign. It means that I'm doing something right. Mm. So, um, yeah, we have whananga, tanga, we have connections, and that's a positive thing in my book. But I don't kid myself that it will mean that I always get an easy ride. I know I also need to ask, answer some tough questions, and that's as it should be. So, um, yeah. has, has that changed over time because of the office that you hold? I mean, obviously you've held a number mm. of offices over time. I think back to your time as Children's Commissioner. Mm. And the hard work at that particular time and the work you did at that time as well. Mm. Has the way in which you have to engage changed as a result of the office that you hold? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I've chosen a career uh, after I was Children's Commissioner and leading up to that, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But I've chosen a career in academic life, which had allowed me a lot of freedom freedom of expression, freedom of thought, mm. the opportunity to connect with very, you know, different disciplinary backgrounds with, uh, you know, people who have traditional knowledge, but also people who are on the cutting edge of creating new knowledge in the world. And to me, I was always really attracted by that because I enjoyed that freedom. 
Now I have to be very mindful of what I say and how I say it because of the role and that's the nature of it. You know, I'm there as Governor General to represent all New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. I'm there to represent the King uh, of New Zealand and I'm there also on behalf of a bigger purpose than myself. And so I have to be respectful of those things and be mindful of them all the time. Why did we found out in May yes. of 2021? <laughs> Why did you say yes? Um, Not knowing that you had been through a career yes. with profile, yes. where you actually became the voice and a little bit of the conscience of our community and society. Yes. Knowing the restrictions that therefore would come with this office, why did you say yes? I think I said yes for a couple of reasons. One was because I'm now well into my 60s, so I'm not a spring chicken anymore, and I knew I probably had one or two jobs left in me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have a job to be the Governor General, which is the representative of the Head of State, the commander in chief for the country. At a time when, you know, I see such talent emerging within Māoridom and within our, within our country, I thought it was an opportunity not to be missed. I mean, how often do you get asked to be a Governor General in your life? I've had lots of people saying to me, I want to be Governor General, how do I apply? And I said, well, first off, you can't apply. <laughs> you have to be asked and the sovereign has to agree. So, um, you know, the opportunity is a once in a lifetime. And I knew I was coming to the end of my working career, um, you know, certainly in terms of full-time paid work. And I thought, well, you know, this is an opportunity to serve in an entirely new and different way. And I do want to make it clear I'd never wanted to be Prime Minister. <laughs> I've never really been attracted enough to go into politics. Really? I loved, no, I loved the freedom of in intellectual and academic thought. I loved knowledge and I love that ability to work across, um, you know, with different communities and different groups. So I knew that was not my path. Were you asked though? Well, maybe, but... <laughs> <laughs> Good but, answer. Good question. But, um, Better yeah, answer. Yeah. <laughs> but I knew it wasn't my pathway. Yeah, yeah. So the honest answer to your question is the timing was right. The opportunity is unique. Um, and I thought it's a critical moment in our country's history. And, you know, that maybe there was something that I could bring to the role mm. which would create... Um, you know, a contribution for the country. So I said yes. Well, what did you think when you first got asked? Well, I have to say that when Prime Minister Ardern asked me, the first thing she said is, you will have your own chef. <laughs> and I sat there thinking... Done. Tick. <laughs> well, actually, she obviously thought that. But I thought, what well, job comes with a chef? <laughs> I really was a bit stumped because I was trying to think. Did you think it was an ambassador's role or? Well, I didn't know what to think. I hadn't really been thinking that I would be asked. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was a bit stumped trying to think, okay, I know that's an incentive, but I'm not quite sure what the incentive is. But anyway, I mean, I was incredibly humbled and I know everybody says that, but I really was. I thought, crikey, really? Really? Mm. Um, and um, I said, can I think about it? Because I knew I would have to talk to Richard. And, um, you know, it wasn't just me who was going to be impacted by this. Um, so, but it was actually a relatively easy decision to make. And it is an incredible honour. Mm. Um, and I had been offered already a damehood. And um, interestingly, the ex-Prime Minister is now a dame as well um, from recent news. So, um, you know, I was really already traversing down that path. I was Chief Executive of the Royal Society yes. Yes. at the time I was asked. 
Um, and the Royal Society is about um, you know, knowledge and celebration of mainly scientific mm. knowledge, but also increasingly understanding indigenous knowledge and its place in the world. And research and, yeah. It, exactly. So, you know, again, that was a kind of trajectory. I was literally a five minute walk from the beehive. So I tottered down there on my own little feet and then tottered back afterwards thinking, whoa, you know. So, yeah, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't a huge ask, but I did know based on my previous experience as children's commissioner that I would lose privacy. And um, I understood that. I understood that you become, you know, through this role, a public figure mm. and we expect a huge amount of our public figures you know I'm sorry weren't you already a public figure I mean in our minds you were already a public figure really well during Children's Commissioner you were the go-to I mean just certainly in my time in media yeah. <clears throat> and legislation pieces of legislation that occurred during your time as well meant that you certainly had a public profile maybe you never felt that way but to us we were we already felt like you were a public figure oh. I'll, I'll be honest with you when, okay. when we found out <laughs> okay tell that me you were going to be appointed governor general yes we all uh, were thinking sure <laughs> yeah good sure not, not bad for someone from far eh? we thought <laughs> Anyway, not generally given to, um, <laughs> to, to the aspects of the ground yes. uh, um, and given our history, but we thought, sure. But, but we also felt that that seemed like a natural part of a pathway, progression. Right. But we always felt you were a public figure, so I'm kind of interested that you, you felt you weren't a public figure at that time. Mm. Certainly a different level of recognition, yeah. but... I'm surprised you felt that way. Yeah. No, don't be surprised. I didn't. I mean, during my time as Children's Commissioner, that was really, really difficult. And I was very public because I was in the media a lot. Mm. And um, I travelled the country a lot and had a lot of um, uh, relationships during, you know, some quite difficult and thorny yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't a public figure in the sense that, you know, almost everything was on public display. Um, and as Governor General, you are that figure. So I knew that. And it does give me a lot of empathy for our political leaders too, and those who take on public roles. You know, I know what it takes for a Prime Minister to have to perform the role, the hours, the loss of privacy, you know, what they have to face up to. And, and the same for all the ministers and the same for all our MPs. It's a huge ask of people. It's a huge imposition on their families and on their lives. So I'm actually always incredibly grateful to them for being prepared to take up the challenge of being in this role. But, you know, I'm also still, and this is something I've really tried to emphasize in my term, I'm still that poor Harangapuhi woman Wahine from Taitukere, who grew up in South Auckland and West yeah. Auckland, and actually I'm proud of that lineage. Mm. You know, I grew up in a working class neighbourhood in West Auckland mm. and in, with my grandparents in yes. South Auckland. And, um, you know, the people that my grandmother used to, who used to call her auntie or nan, you know, had black power patches or, you know, they were the local kids, you know, who had no homes and they had no kai. So I'm very familiar with those lives. And to me, you know, that was normal mm. to be with people who didn't have much and who shared what they had. Mm. And uh, that aspect of manakitanga is deeply, deeply important to me because that's what I grew up with. Mm. I grew up with my grandparents and my parents displaying that and sharing what they had with the neighbours, with all the kids, you know, with whoever. Um, and I still see that actually in my behaviour. My husband who didn't grow up with that quite in the same way with his Welsh and English family, um, you know, says that I always had too much kai 
I always prepared as if I was going to feed 100 people <laughs> when only four were supposed to come. And I said, well, you never know who's going to show up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I could see, you know, it's still there. Yeah. It still persists. Those views are still there. Now, of course, I don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to have a meal because we will <laughs> get fed and I have a chef. Yeah, exactly. For a period of time, <laughs> I have a chef. Yeah. But, um, you know, those things are so deep-rooted. Those values that my grandparents mm. lived by and our neighbourhood lived by and our neighbours and the kids I grew up with, um, so they're still there mm. and they'll always be a part of defining who I am. Is it hard to retain that sense of self in a role like this? I mean, you would have seen today when the Kai Mahi were lined yeah. up and they didn't know whether to curtsy or bow. <laughs> <laughs> or hungi or, or afi or, you know, yeah. or come and see auntie, yeah. uh, you know, kind of thing. So is it hard to retain that sense of self in a role like this when you have people saluting? I mean, yeah. one imagines yeah. that um, when, one, when, when we, you're being saluted exiting a car, it must be like, me. <laughs> 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 That's how we imagine it. Yeah. But how do, you, how do you retain that sense of self? And I, I know you'll be deep rooted in your own foundational beliefs and your upbringing. But it must, there must be times at which, and we won't talk about where you're going because I'm not sure if these are state secrets or not, but there must yeah. be times at which, even when you go to big ceremonies in the UK yeah. with King Charles, yeah. that you go, wow, this is me. Yeah. You know, so how, how do you do that retention of yeah. who you are? Well, I think in terms of the role nationally, it's pretty straightforward um, because you realise pretty quickly that actually whatever's comfortable for me is what sets the tone for the okay. interaction. Okay. So, um, you know, people don't need to be nervous because, you know, pretty quickly we'll establish a rapport. Uh, I know that there's a very different protocol for, you know, meeting a community organisation mm. or iwi leaders or, um, you know, the head of defence forces, uh, you know, all with visiting royal family members. And we had the Princess Royal and the Duke of Edinburgh last year mm -hmm. visit and stay at different times. Um, but you quickly establish, A, you have to be your authentic self. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you can only ever be yourself, right? Um, and you also have to be adaptable because whatever the situation is that you're in, is the situation that I have to respond to. Mm. And when I go and meet with a bunch of kids who are doing, you know, the Aroha Nui Strings Orchestra, who are mostly kids from Porirua, yeah. or I go and meet, um, you know, visit a marae who's giving out food, you know, as part of the food security thing, the way that I interact with them feels really normal and natural. Um, and it's the same when I meet with the leaders of the New Zealand Defence Force. So I hosted a dinner the night before last with the Chief of Defence Force and all his new leadership team, you know, Chief of Navy, Chief of Army, Chief of Air Force, um, the Chief of Joint Command, his Vice Chief um, and their spouses. And it was wonderfully um, formal but also relaxed. So, you know, I'm now three years into the role, my training wheels are off. Yeah. Um, that was more of a challenge when I first came into the role because, in a way, you have to fake it till you make it, you, you know, <laughs> without being fake about it, but understanding that you're learning the protocols as you go along. It would have been different too because that time we were still going through COVID. Yeah, uh, I got, I was out of COVID by the time I was appointed. Um, so, you know, Dame Patsy really got the COVID yeah. period. So I was fortunate because I got the post-COVID period. But certainly uh, coming out of a process of COVID yeah. anyway, in a country that was a little bit different as a result of that and still trying yeah. to work through. Yeah, that's true. And um, it meant that there was a lot of catch up too. Mm. So a lot of people couldn't, for example, be invested during the COVID period. So there's a lot of catch up. But just in answer to your question, you know, there are moments, of course, where it doesn't feel you know, I think, geez, is this for real? <laughs> you know, and like, for example, I'll give you, I'm patron for the Olympic Committee. Yes, yes. So I'm patron for about 160 yes. organisations. <clears throat> um, and as patron of the Olympic Committee, I went to the Paris Olympics just this year. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Richard and I were sat in the pouring rain, I might say, at the Paris Olympics in front of the Eiffel Tower mm. with, you know, President Macron behind us in the VIP box, looking down the top of door to the Eiffel Tower and I thought, is this for real? <laughs> you know, I was seated next to the presidents and the and we were all getting wet, yeah. right? And I there are moments like that when I sort of catch myself and think, you know, is this for real? Yeah. And then I think, well, I'm dealing with the practicalities like how to stay as dry as possible, <laughs> how to stay warm, how to watch the events unfold, um, you know. And I'd met with the um, lead diplomat for Mongolia inside the VIP tent. I met, had a conversation with the president of Slovenia about their top, you know, the top world's top cyclist who's there. Um, uh, so, you know, there are extraordinary moments uh, that happen around these events and with people coming into the country. And it is possible. I had the President of India um, come on a state visit recently and hosted her and yes. got to meet her daughter who was travelling with her. And that was wonderful. I met the most senior Nidia, uh, diplomats from India, you know, absolutely charming. And you get some real insights into not just the country, but also what's going on and what's prior being prioritised and how. Um, and there are moments because you meet the person, you know, you have to meet the person as a person, as a whole person. And uh, she was, um, interestingly, she's the first tribal woman yes. to ever become president of India. And so uh, we were particularly interested in meeting each other and, uh, you know, having that conversation together. Uh, so that was a very special uh, visit. Um, and also I should tell you that one of the real highlights for me in going, for example, to the coronation of King Charles was the opportunity to meet up with the Governor General of Canada, oh, yeah. who's an Indigenous woman, yeah. a First Nations woman, uh, Mary Simon, and she's an extraordinary person too and I can't explain it but there's just a sense of comfort you know without her having to tell me her story I kind of already had an understanding of how and who she was and how she got there. And her of you. And her of mm -hmm. me. So there is a level of comfort mm -hmm. you know and I don't say joy is probably not the right word but of celebrating being there together mm -hmm. and being able to share this together. Well, I met the um, Indian president because she, after she met with you, <coughs> she came to a conference, International yeah. Education Conference. That's right, at the yes. Conference. yes. By, and I, I said I met her, I introduced her as the MC, <laughs> and then was, and was told to get 50 metres away from her and then had to present her with the dialogue. Uh, but an amazing woman. Yes. And, and uh, again, those are, those are moments at which you must, you must pinch yourself. Uh, so one of the things, and I do want to talk about your career pre uh, your role as Governor General. But one of the things that also must be interesting to deal with is just the impact on on wider whanau. I mean, I'm sure, you know, David didn't mind parking up his motorbike at Epsom, but... No, he doesn't. <laughs> and he still misses you, because I think you two watch sports together, and he's yeah, still yeah. an avid sports I went watcher. very quiet after the Hurricanes lost the semi-final <laughs> with David. I haven't spoken to him since, but um, that's by the by. But it must be quite impactful for them It is, as well. yeah. Yeah, immense pride. Mm. And also, um, you know, they love coming and I love having them because they're my touchstone to yeah. reality, you know, my mokos yeah. and our boys, our kids. How many mokopuna have you got? Just two. Yeah. Yeah. What's the names? Kahu and Miharu. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So um, very proud, of course, when Miharu won Tama, you know, the first Tama. Uh, leading his kapahaka group last year for his school for West Auckland. He was immensely proud and so was his nana and so was his, his abuela, his Chilean grandmother wow. and his tata, his Chilean grandfather. So, you know, we, we, we were all very proud of him. And uh, Kahu, who goes to Liston College here in West oh, yeah. Auckland, mm. and, uh, you know, he's a lovely, lovely young man doing well and we're talking already about what he'll do at university and... 
So, you know, they're my pride and joy. Oh, right. Of course, as every Nana probably thinks, yeah. uh, my husband tells me off. He says that the problem is that my Nana vocabulary misses a word and it's N-O. <laughs> So there's no such word as N-O in Nana's vocabulary. <laughs> I just thought that was normal nanny tikanga. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you know. So, uh, yeah. But, you know, it's lovely. It's, it's such a pleasure mm. to be able to host them. Mm. You know, they love coming because they always get a really good meal. Mm. Uh, it's great to have chefs, <laughs> um, you know, and great service. And they don't have to do the dishes. Don't have to do the dishes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they get to catch up. And yeah. my time is precious. Mm. So for me, I really treasure those moments. Mm. And I'm really grateful that the staff that I have actually enable that to, to, to occur. Otherwise, I'd really struggle. Mm. It's, it's hard to understand, but it's quite difficult to stay in touch with people. It's difficult for me to go to somebody's house. Mm. Um, people who I might have had contact with, I can't just show up at their place because, you know, they might be current members of parliament or they might have strong political associations or uh, there may be security concerns. So, you know, all of these things are considerations I never had before. But uh, when Dame June Mariu died, mm. I immediately said, I have to go to her tangi. Mm not just because of who she was for the country and what she stood for for Aotearoa New Zealand, but because she was so instrumental in my sense of being proud to be Māori mm -hmm. and proud to be on an educational journey. So I went, you know, not very conveniently, right down to her marae. From a mm. And um, was there with Rawiri and, um, uh, you know, uh, all whānau apanui and, you know, her whānau. And uh, I saw all of Te Atatū there. I saw the ngatas. I thought it was, somebody said to me at one stage, <laughs> somebody said to me, oh, my son Kahu, who came with me, my, my older son, came with me. And he said, geez, mum, he says, I feel like I'm standing at Haddad's on a Saturday night. <laughs> he recognised everybody and they all came up and it was so lovely to catch up with them all. Yeah. But, you know, because there's such a strong community yeah. when we were growing up in Te Aratu and, mm. uh, you know, around Hawaii, Waititi Marae and Dame June Mariu and Sepita and, you know, all of them were part of my growing up years, my crucial high school years, mm. my kids growing up and now my mokos. And um, so I went down there to pay homage, a homage to her and to acknowledge what she meant. And um, it was just wonderful. I was so proud that I went. I, of course, had to go with security and with ADCs. Mm. And, um, you know, we were there and uh, we had a lively time. Um, I had Lively is an interesting word. <laughs> I, I, I was sat with one of the nanas on the porch, which I love because I'm now of nana status, right? <laughs> so I sat, sat with a warm, on a warm, comfortable couch with a warm blanket over me with a nana who was hilarious telling me stories about <laughs> who was going to do what. And they said, oh, they always do that. Oh, so and so, you know, she'd already anticipated everything. And then for the service, out pops Rob Ruha. <laughs> and I'm looking and I'm thinking, isn't that Rob Ruha? <laughs> What's he doing conducting the service? <laughs> I didn't realise he did services. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. I can tell you that Marae had the most amazing waiata. Oh, yeah. A most amazing waiata. And, you know, all credit to Rawiri and to that Marae and to, you know, I asked them to sing for me. They gave me a space to speak during the hākari, which I stayed for, and um, uh, I asked them to sing on my behalf, and just incredible. The atmosphere was incredible. Um, um, uh, you're meant to remain apolitical, and you sound very much like you're supporting Rāwini and Rob and their kapahaka before the mother uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I certainly wouldn't get involved in Matatini <laughs> politics, that's for sure. I think that's even more... <laughs> more difficult than national politics and international <laughs> politics. Definitely. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, your grandparents 
yes. brought you down here to South Auckland and then eventually mm. to West Auckland. We, you were brought up by your grandparents. How did that happen? I was. So, um, because you're the eldest of the of, of the, the Mokos who were raised by them. So they mm. raised uh, five or six Mokos, and we lived with my grandparents. I was the eldest of them, and I was the eldest of my siblings. Mm. So I went back to live with my siblings when I was a little bit older, and uh, I think I must have been about three or four when I went back to live with my siblings, but I spent all my holidays with my grandparents. Wow. Um, and they continued really to be, you know, a crucial part of my life right through until they died. And they died in their early 60s, so very young. Mm. Um, well, why did that happen? Um, I think it happened because my mother, uh, who was a wonderful social light, was not the most reliable person in the world. And um, so grandparents often in those days would mm. take grandchildren and, you know, that was a very normal pattern for mm. them to have the moko and to look after the moko in a sort of stable environment. And actually before I came here I was reflecting on if I could identify some of the key things that I think makes me who I am. It was that I knew early on because of that relationship with my maternal grandparents my Māori grandparents, their first language was te reo. Mm -hmm. They spoke to each other in te reo, they spoke to all their visitors in te reo. They didn't speak to their grandchildren in te reo because they were punished for speaking mm -hmm. te reo. And they wanted us to grow up speaking English, which we did. But we would hear them speaking to everybody in te reo. But the thing that my grandparents gave me which I think has been the most solid thing in my life, is I always knew I was loved unconditionally. It doesn't mean to say that they didn't uh, expect lots of us. They did. We were expected to feed visitors. We were expected to clean up after everybody. We were expected to follow simple rules. You're not allowed to throw hair or nails into the fire. You're not allowed to waste food. You know, there were heaps of things and they were very strict in many ways. But I always knew that. And I think to the career that I chose, first in social work, in public health, and with children's advocacy, in every way it goes to trying in some way to step up to a place where people who haven't had unconditional mm -hmm. love are suffering. You know, and interestingly, I'm now married to someone who was a doctor working for the Auckland City Mission working with people who have experienced trauma in their lives, particularly in their childhood or growing up. And in some way, the two of us shared that interest in common, you know, always being interested in people who didn't get that start in life, who couldn't rely on at least one person, one adult to stand up for them and to have their back. And I think, you know, the biggest blessing is that. That defines really whether we're most likely to succeed in life mm. and go on to places, unexpected places, including being heads of state, <laughs> yeah. you know, including being political leaders, including being iwi leaders, thought leaders, mm. technology leaders, you know, wherever it is in the world. In some way, I think that grounding just allows us to be able to go out from there. Do, do you think your career in social work was always going to be the path that you would follow given that knowledge that you had of the unconditional love that was given to you by your by your grandparents? Or was it a subconscious thing or was there some divine intervention do you think that kind of was at play that foundationally led you onto yeah. that path? It was completely unconscious. Mm. I don't have any, I, I mean, like everybody else, I was scrambling around trying to work out, you know, how to deal with life. Um, it's only in reflection, and I am, I think, still quite a reflective person. I do like to think back on my actions, which are not always noble and not always as good as I hope that they should be, but um, capable of thinking about what has happened and it's only now I can understand that. So I say it to you, understanding in retrospect. But at the time, I was just a confused and at times angry teenager and not quite sure, you know. So I relied on um, 
the people in my life, and that's why I say Dame June mm. and, you know, Tame um, Uncle Tom, Tame, we used to call him, and, um, you know, the ones around the marae, the local ones from the Women's Welfare League, mm. um, you know, my grandparents and my parents, you know, I relied on them to steer me because, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't an angel. Um, you know, life was tough, and I grew up in a tough, a tough few neighbourhoods. Um, but I always knew that I would have a home to go to, I would have a bed to go to, I would have food. It wasn't always tasty food. My mother was a lousy <laughs> cook. She couldn't bake. Um, but, you know, I would always have food. And that provides a strong degree of security. Mm. And you've mentioned before being the eldest. I think, for me, birth position did matter. Mm. I grew up as an eldest with both the mokos raised by my grandparents and as the eldest of my siblings. You know, there's five or six of us. So is there a weight of responsibility requirement going on here? Okay. Exactly. So I knew that I was, I had to be responsible, you know, and um, I knew that I had to step up. And again, this is a very common pattern mm. amongst Māori mm. families, right? is that eldest children are expected to help look after the younger children um, and the eldest in particular is expected to be you know responsible and caregiving and organizing and i'm all those things um, you know overly so probably um, bossy has come into <laughs> the lexicon occasionally from yeah just you know i just say organized <laughs> and determined, but um, yeah, that term has come up. And it's compensating for things, it's anticipating things, it's planning for things, it's knowing that, um, you know, it's not just about me, mm. it's also about them. And, um, uh, you know, being prepared to act in that way. So I think what it, what it has done is it's prepared me very early on in life to be to accept responsibility and to know that um, that's something that you have to carry. I don't want to say like a burden, it is just something that you carry. So it does mean that, you know, I can't go off the deep end, you know. Others but, are relying on... Yeah, but, but it can thing. be burdens and I don't want to get uh, again back into your role as a children's commissioner because because. I, I will talk about that, but mm. I guess the other thing is, you said that there were some issues. Yeah. This is me paraphrasing, issues in your teenage years. Do you think part of that was moving to Auckland? And and the fact that, you know, as I said, you were born in Whaharei. Yeah. You were brought up in the north, the kettles are from up north. Your, your maternal yeah. grandmother's a maihi. She is a maihi, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, that's a bit hokianga hard and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, um, there was a lot of the issues that cropped up over time, you know, that kind of, oh, for want of a better way of putting it, displacement and, and moving and moving away from environments, or was there something else going on? No, I, th I don't think so, because I moved to Auckland very young. Okay. So my grandparents were part of the 1950s diaspora or early 60s diaspora who moved, you know, they urbanised because there was no work in mm. the communities to survive anymore. My granddad used to work up at the um, dairy factory in... Um, Oh, I forgot the name of Mangakahi or some, uh, not oh, yeah. Mangakahi, but on the turn off by Portland. Um, and when they couldn't secure work anymore, they had to come to the city to look for work. Mm. So, uh, you know, I was very young when they came down. And so I wasn't really, it wasn't really that urbanising and that dislocation from the life we had from Taitukero. It was the normal process of being an adolescent and growing up and trying to find who you are in the world. Um, you know, I mean, I had a brief association with uh, gang life, i.e. me and my first cousins who were growing up with my grandmas thought we were gangsters because we would go around Linmore, you know, and we'd pout and carry on and think that we were hot stuff and nobody was going to take us on. I mean, we were just a complete laugh. You know, we, we had nothing going for us, really. But I um, never knew that, you know. Oh, no, no. 
And we kept dr trying to dream up names of the toughest gangster name we could come up with. But Crazy we were, horses or something. Oh, you know, we were pathetic, really. And, um, you know, really all it was about was trying to stick together and think that we could defend each mm. other. Um, but we didn't do anything, you know, didn't do anything serious. But, yeah, we were just trying to find who we were in the world. Mm. And everybody else we knew was doing it, so we thought we'd do it too. But um, I knew quite early on that that wasn't, you know, I wasn't made... My makeup was different. Right. You know, um, somebody laughingly in my family once said to me that I was the kid who sat in the corner with a ball of fluff picking at it. And I thought, goodness, you know, I'm not sure that that's something that would recommend me to anyone. But, <laughs> you know, obviously I was always a more quieter kid. Yeah. And, you know, I loved reading. Contemplative. Thank you. That's a beautiful <laughs> term. Thank you. Um, you know, I was always the more reflective kid, yeah. and um, I knew I liked reading, I liked drawing, I liked um, art, and so I knew the things that I was drawn to early yeah. on. And, um, you know, one of the things about going to school is that actually I liked school. I really enjoyed school. I liked the structure of it. I liked the fact that it got me away from having to clean the house and run errands. And, you know, I couldn't be made to do those things while I was at school. I could actually focus on trying to learn something. Mm. I could be socialised with friends. I could play sport. You know, to me, this was a real freedom. So I knew from an early age that I liked school. And I think that's an experience that's been incredibly positive in my life. And not necessarily the case for lots of people. And not the case for a lot of people. And I'm really... Again, you know, it's no, in a way, it's not accidental that I ended up going into both public health and that mm. I can talk about where I ended up there, um, and also into education mm. because I saw the value of education and I still see the value of education. Education has transformed my life. Now, if you had asked that pōhara, taitukaro kid, you know, what I was going to do, I would have had no clue what I was going to do. And if you had told me, that I would go on to get a master's mm. and a PhD and a, PhD. Yeah. And a damehood mm. and be able to, it is inconceivable. I didn't even know what a university was. I had no idea what it was. No one in my family knew what it was. So all of these are, uh, you know, ideas that were outside the realm of any experience I had or mm. my family had. So always trying to navigate that space as I come up to it. But you know, it's taught me something so important about opportunities, not just myself, but when you see those kids, you know, whoever they are, wherever they are, actually we don't understand their full potential. Mm -hmm. We can only hope and imagine what their full potential is because they could be anything. Yeah. They no, could be anything. The, the problem I guess we have, <coughs> Your Excellency, is that um, it's the inequity of the opportunity and the access that mm. aren't given to those who, but for potentially the grace of God or whatever, end up in a position where you are now holding the mm. office that you hold. Mm. And given your role, you talk about public health and other roles that you've had, upon my own reflection of it, having a look through your career, is that I see you advocating for, for, for equity, mm. is, is what I see. Mm. Um, and that may be a really basic and simplistic way of referencing it, but we still have an issue about that. Mm. The inequitable access that we have to lots of opportunity. Mm. When you are in those roles of responsibility that you have, both as a researcher and an academic and also an office holder and as you know, CEOs in those kind of roles, how did you try and deal with that? What, what do we do to try and make sure that we still get those equitable outcomes? Just the opportunity and the access that you got mm. so that people who dare to dream can achieve those kind of things or at least access the opportunity to be able to do it because I think we still struggle with it. Mm, we do. And if anything, I think you know the world is a more unequal place now than it was 10 years ago. And that's, that's do you, a real... Do you think so? I think, I think in many ways it is. I'm talking globally. Yes, yes. Well, why um, do you think that is, though? Um, there's lots of reasons that I think it, it is. I think um, that sometimes um, 
you know, the, obviously people who have money accumulate money uh, and not always willing to share it. Um, I think we uh, need to recognise that technology has played a valuable part in developing new opportunities, but it also has consolidated certain things. So, for example, you know, we've seen the rise of social media mm. as an important uh, way of getting information out in the world. And that's had pluses and minuses. Um, we see wars going on in the world, um, you know, trying to deal in coercive ways with long-standing grievances. Um, I see the rise of a kind of victimology, which I don't like, where people feel aggrieved about something and they think that the way to deal with it is through aggression or threats or through misinformation or undermining. Um, you know, I'm completely of a view that um, the only way forward for all of us is by honest sharing of good knowledge, good quality knowledge, information, resources, and a claim to those fundamental values that make us good human beings. Mm. And, you know, that means that uh, to me, I think, you know, those values of manaki, those values of being prepared to share, those values of understanding that you cannot be an island unto yourself in the modern world, uh, that you know what happens in terms of climate change in one place actually has an effect in other places, um, and you know so we have to see ourselves as connected. We understand that we are connected, and you know everything in science and everything in our traditional matauranga tells us we are connected. Mm. We're connected deeply, deeply, not just to the whenua, but to each other in ways that we are only beginning to truly understand. Yeah, it's a global community. Yeah. I mean, look, look at and us in our Pacific brothers and sisters. Exactly, exactly. But I guess the problem is, is that there's also a perspective of the myopic isolationism mm. that seems to have grounded itself now in ways which is hard to parry. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we see people who dare to put their head above the parapet and dealing with, with some fairly mm. fundamental societal issues attacked. Mm. And I, I wonder, Your Excellency, if we support enough those people who are brave enough to be public advocates mm. for things like we're talking about now, mm. whether we give them enough support um, to be able to maintain Mm. Uh, the ability to talk in the way that they do, mm. e even even in New Zealand, in a mm. country like New Zealand, which is a you know a Western mm. liberal democracy. Yes, and yet we've seen. I mean, have a look at universities and Matauranga Māori and things of that nature. I guess I'm raising these issues because, I, you know, it feels like we're at a, a really crucial point in time. Yeah, we're at an inflection point in history. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the answer to your question is rhetorical because the answer is clearly yes, we do need to provide support to them. And what I wanted to say to you, because I didn't really answer your question about the importance of equity. There is no doubt in my mind that equity is important and um, that creating equal opportunities is not about sameness, mm. it's about making sure people have what they need to be able to be their best person. Because as I said before, we never know who the next you know, technological genius or, yeah. you yeah. know, political leader or global breakthrough person is going to be. We don't actually know what the future is going to demand of us, you know, and maybe it's going to be that incredibly creative mind that allows us to think differently that's going to be what we actually need most. I don't know what it is and none of us do. Mm. But um, I do believe that actually what we need are people who ask searching questions, and that's why I said yes to you, um, because it's important that we are prepared to explore things in a different way, from a different lens. 
it's important that we have something to counter a really damaging negative narrative in the world and in our country because actually we have to remain hopeful mm. um, and believe you me I'm a realist and I get incredibly pessimistic at times but I have I remain hopeful I especially remain hopeful of our younger people mm. and I remain hopeful of indigenous people and our kind of leadership and what that will mean in terms of its value to the world mm. which I think is only now coming to the fore I remain hopeful that we will have you know political leaders who truly believe you know, in the depths of their soul about the importance of humanity going forward, mm. and that we will have visionary leaders who will give us a quality of life um, that we can share and be better off with. But I also, you know, I don't believe that utopia is around the corner and that it will be won easily. It'll be won by protecting the things that guard us, an independent judiciary, mm a visionary political leadership, a calm and meaningful conversation about constitutional arrangements, um, a commitment to understand our history going forward, and our deep belief in our shared connectedness as human beings. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things, and in the importance of our natural world. You know, these are things that if we deal with those things, it can only be a good thing. And I remain, look, I'm so immensely proud when I'm able to travel overseas and say that I'm the Governor General of New Zealand, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I've only ever had one person say, why would I want to go to New Zealand? And I'll tell you about them in a minute, because that's really interesting. Everybody wants to come to New Zealand. Yeah. They all think of New Zealand as a beacon of hope. Mm. And, um, you know, and so they should. And this is especially true amongst our indigenous communities, you know, whether we go to Hawaii or our Aboriginal cousins and sisters, um, you know, in the Pacific, in you know, North America, wherever we go. And that's not an accident. That's perseverance. That is commitment. That is vision. That is energy. That is passion, right? Um, but hopefully it's also wisdom because we need to have the nows to understand that not everything can be passed on that is of value. Sometimes we need to question those things too. Um, but just to come back to the point, I think you know we are so lucky to live in a country of such profound beauty and of a history that we can actually share. Mm. We're so lucky to have what I consider to be inspiring young people, you know, and talented people um, who are coming through both in our indigenous and also in our non-indigenous community. I sit on the Rhodes Scholarship Board. I meet the most amazing young people, incredible people. They're going to make such a difference in the world. Um, and, you know, if I could look at myself at age 20, and be even a fraction of what they are would have been proud of myself. You know, we have these people. They're in our country, they're in our community. They're willing to come forward, you know, and so we have to recognise that. Yeah. Um, we also have to recognise all the things that we don't like to talk about, you know. When I was Children's Commissioner, I used to raise things like people's attitudes towards children and young people, you know, the violence that mm. we mm. inflicted against children and young people. So we also have to be real about the things that we deal with. Now the story I was going to tell you is an interesting story. So I had dinner at the Paris Olympics. I was invited by the head of the International Olympic Committee, as all of the heads of state and heads of government were, to a dinner at the Louvre. So you can imagine, we're seated at a table. It's the longest table I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it has 400 people around it. Yeah. Underneath the pyramid of the Louvre. Yes. Right. Yes. What seen to be one of the cultural beacons of the world. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, sitting there and opposite me is the Prime Minister of Iceland, the head of the UNHCR. Oh, yeah. 
so the, the UN refugee, yes. uh, the president of Haiti, um, and you know a number of others. You get the picture. Oh, yeah. um, down the stairs toddles Elon Musk, who looks very lost. <laughs> say no more. I know who said this. And. I have a vacant seat next to me because I can't remember if it's Moldovia or someone, mm. but anyway, they didn't come to the dinner. So I see him and I think, and this is, I believe, genuinely my monarchy. I see people and they look lost or uncomfortable. He looks lost, lost and uncomfortable at the best of times, by the way, but <laughs> carry on. No, no. But, <laughs> so I went up and I said, would you like to join us, join yeah. me for dinner and join us? And he said, yes. Mm. So, so I had dinner with Elon. And we talked about his family and his kids and his ideas and, you know, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, couldn't, I don't want to share private, too much private no, no, conversation. No. But what struck me, amongst many other things, I mean, he's immensely proud of all his kids, obviously. Mm. Um, I begged him not to call his next child Z because he's got, <laughs> he's got one called X and one called Y. <laughs> exactly. I said, please don't name your next one Z. <laughs> but um, um, it's, uh, he believes that technology will save us. And I don't believe that. A bit technology can help us immensely. You know, food security, um, you know, environmental damage, restoration, you know, and I'm hopeful that we will find ways to save carbon and draw it out of the atmosphere and create, you know, more effective carbon um, sinks and regeneration of oxygen and all of that. I'm hopeful for these things because, you know, we've got to keep pursuing it. It's, it's, it's already upon us. But I don't actually believe that technology will save us because at the end of the day, it's about those deep-seated things that make us human beings and our interaction with our natural world. You know, I really believe this is the crucial relationship technology is an enabler mm. or a hindrance mm. and I'm hoping it'll be used as an enabler and I'm hoping even more that it will be available to all mm. because at the moment we already have the capacity to feed everyone in the world mm. but we do not do it mm. so you know one has to ask the question about why now creating more food to feed the few, or the ones who can access it, is not a solution mm. for humanity. It's great, but it's only great when we actually share it. You know, I really believe that there are, there is a future where that will play a huge role. And obviously, you know, we talked about AI mm. and uh, amongst other things, um, really interesting <laughs> things. Um, but. Uh, at the end of the day, those relationships, the things that we value in our lives, the connections that we have to other people, mm. the joy that we have in being out in natural beauty, in being able to drink clean water, you know, and in being able to smell fresh air, these are things that are so intrinsic to our survival, so intrinsic to our sense of who we are in the world, that you know we have to do everything we can to preserve them. So yeah, I don't think it's going to be solved for us. We have and, to and persevere. So, so just to clarify, this is the guy who said, "Why would I go to New Zealand?" Right? It is. Oh, yeah. But again, that shows the type of person you are, because I'm not sure I would have been as ingratiating in inviting him no. to sit beside me. I think, me. I think <laughs> there's lots of people who feel that way. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. you know, maybe I was naive, but as I say, I acted, for me, it was monarchy. Yeah, and I how, how to moon real tell. Aye, aye. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, I, I also, and I have to say, there was a slightly ulterior motive. I was sat opposite the head of the UNHCR. Yeah. And I just had a conversation with him. I asked him, I said, what is your biggest worry? What is the thing that keeps you awake at night? And he said it was Sudan. Now, bear in mind, we're in a world where the Ukraine mm. has been invaded by Russia. And Israel. Where and Israel, Gaza, and Palestine, and, and yeah. yep, and things are on a knife's edge in many, many places in the world. He said Sudan, 10 million people displaced, uh -huh. 20 million on the point of starvation. 
that's what keeps him awake at night. So I had just had that conversation with him when I spotted Elon Musk. And I thought, what an opportunity yeah. to bring over the world's richest man to talk to the head of the UNHCR. So, you know, a slight ulterior motive, I have oh, to confess. Um, and, you know, so we had a bit of a conversation around Sudan. And, um, and I thought, again, this is about those unexpected moments where that kind of uh, conversation can take place. You know, nothing immediately came of it. I would have thought donating 75 million US to the UNHCR might be might a have useful, been a good move. Yeah. might have been a useful thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows? But, uh, uh, you know, that could not have been possible unless that opportunity had come up. And um, anyway, yeah. Uh, you, you know what, uh, it just struck me that, um, that but for, uh, you know, the gang in Newland Mall, that might not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the gang did nothing, believe in me. And they certainly did nothing good and nothing worthwhile. <laughs> but they made us feel a bit better about ourselves. Um, Gee, I, I could talk to you for hours, you know. Uh -huh. But you've got a job to do. I have Trust indeed. me, mine's not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really wish I could. I, I just wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, and I know you were expecting tough questions, and none of them have been tough at all. But um, Cindy's your middle name, isn't it? It's a nickname. It's not even my name. What is your name? Uh, Alcyon is my first name, and Cynthia is my second name. So Cindy is a nickname for Cynthia. Where, where is Elsian from? Um, my auntie was called, so it's Greek. And why a kid from Taitukero would have two Greek names is beyond me, but it's true. I, I like to say, the story I like to tell is that maybe it was associated with the Māori Battalion and our role in yeah, Crete or World somewhere, II, yeah. right? World War II. But um, my family used to like to tell me, my grandparents and my aunties and uncles, that they had a pet cow called Cindy. And the nickname came out of that. But I don't really like that story quite so much. But yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nickname. Um, so it's not my real name. Mm. Yeah. I, I just, when I read Elsie on, I went, wow, what an interesting name. Yeah, it's my auntie. I'm named after my auntie. Is that your mum's? Mum's sister, yeah. Oh. Now, I've got another really, before we finish, I must tell you sure. a really interesting thing. So, my, the sole remaining sibling of my mother and of her generation is my Auntie Monica, who lives on the Gold Coast. She's lived there for mm. decades. She's 92 now. I had this burning desire to go and see her. I don't know why, but I felt I had to go and see her. Mm. I haven't seen her for 10 years. So I went, took my sister over and my moko over with me and I went to see her a week ago, just over a week ago, two weeks ago. And it was fantastic. I mean, you know, I'm so glad I went mm -hmm. to see her because mm -hmm. she's getting a bit yeah. forgetful. And it was such a pleasure. So this is her ring, this one here, mm -hmm. her engagement ring, which she insisted I take. And um, so I've got it, I'm wearing her, the last of the siblings, mm. my auntie Mon. Um, and while I was there, I met with all my first cousins, all of her family, you know, her five kids. And the thing that struck me, we were able to tell stories, including our nicknames, and stories, you know, from way back when we were all kids. But they told me that their um, niece had done something recently. She got all of the siblings, so all of my first cousins in that family, to write a story about particular events. And then they were to compare their version of the story with each other. So they all grew up in the same family, mm -hmm. had the same life experiences, and they all thought, we all thought. Yet they all had completely different views about the same events in life. And that was really interesting. I was really struck by that when mm -hmm. they told me that, because we have different memories. You know, we were talking about things that we remembered together, mm -hmm. you know, family Christmases and you know, and they said, do you remember the time that, you know, and I couldn't remember that or I did remember that. But it does strike me that sometimes our memories are highly selective, even amongst our own family. 
and what we recall and the kind of narrative that we begin to tell ourselves is really important and becomes self-fulfilling. Mm. But this, the bit I really wanted to share with you is I had just been not too long before that to Kingi to Haitia's Tangi. Mm. And that was a moment in history. Mm. And I'm really proud and I'm grateful that I did go. Um, and um, I was immensely proud that Ngāti Hine came with me um, and Wasi Shortland was there with me. Um, and so some of us in Ngāpōi thought it was an interesting fuck-up-up decision. <laughs> 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 well, they told me they were coming, I think, is how it happened. But anyway, yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I leave that for others to yes, work out. And, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and Wasi told me just before I went on, was called on um, at the morning um, mm. session uh, about whakapapa between myself and Tuhetia, mm. which I didn't know, Kingi Tuhetia. I never knew this mm. until he told me mm. the story. So I went on and I was able to say I was there wearing three hats on behalf of all of the people of New Zealand, mm. on behalf of King Charles, the head of state, you know, and I read the message from the king, and as someone who shared whakapapa, and I had put my pare kawakawa mm -hmm. in front of his coffin to acknowledge that whakapapa connection and the tears that I left behind for my brother. Mm -hmm. So, all well and good. And when I went to Australia with my cousins, who haven't been back to New Zealand very often in the last 40 years, they said, oh, do you remember that time we went to King Koroki's tangihanga? Oh, wow! <laughs> Did you go? I didn't go, but my grandmother and oh. the eldest of the... Um, they went oh. with my gran with our grandmother. Oh. The mahi. Yeah, yeah, um, And they said, yeah, we didn't know... But Nanny was sat next to his coffin. Oh. I know. I didn't know this. Your grandmother was... My sick. grandmother. Oh. Um, I, don't, I don't know, Julian, but this is what they told me, mm. right? She was sat next to the coffin and then the eldest of the mook was Fiona, my cousin Fiona, who was telling us the story and they were all saying, yeah, yeah, mm. we remember going there because we had to walk up that steep hill mm. um, with this heavy coffin. And she said she was sat next to Nanny and she said all these people were crying and they were laying down mm. the mm. green ferns, you know, this is her recounting the story at 68, 69 years of age. Mm. I had never, ever, I never heard my grandmother talk about this, that I remember. Mm. And yet, after all these years and after this recent event, here I am told the story of how she was there and my cousin was there at that tangihunga and there when Dame Te Hatarangi Kahu became queen. Mm. Extraordinary. And again, these completely unexpected connections that come out of, you know, places that I never would have thought. Who would have thought going to the Gold Coast I would hear the story <laughs> of King Koroki's Tanga Yang, yeah. right? Yeah. And I did. So, again, I'm mindful that there are things even in our own stories that are unexpected and unexplored, and sometimes it just takes a chance encounter to find out what it is. Mm. And in a way, it all adds to the richness and the texture mm. of the story of our life and of the people that we come from. And uh, anyway, I think that's I think what I want to share with you. I think a lot about your extraordinary life. <clears throat> because as you know, you are the first Wahine Māori Governor General. I think the third Māori Governor General. So Paul Reeves. So Paul Reeves. There was another one. Oh, so Jerry Matapurai. Jerry Matapurai. Jerry Matapurai. Yeah. The third Māori um, Governor General. You talked about that whakapapa with the Maihiks. There was court at all at one stage that people wanted Sir James Henare to become Governor General, but of course yes. he passed away before yes. before that opportunity presented itself. Yes. Um, so, you know, we talk about people attaining lofty office and roles that you have, um, but you've been very honest um, about your life. Um, and again, part of me still pinches myself to think why you said yes to this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But thank you. And Pleasure. I mean, I, I just want you also to know that um, that I, I know you feel a sense of, of pride. There'll be also uh, humility 
uh, in the fact that it's you in the office. But, but we see you, we see us. Like, you know that, eh? Yeah. We see you and we see us. And, and that's not just the Ngāpuhi talking, right? That's, that's Māori will be going, they see you and they see us. Mm. And, um, and I think that, that, yes, it's inspirational and invigorational and motivational. Um, but as you've said throughout this interview, it also means that um, opportunities come. Mm. Sometimes you don't know what they're about. Sometimes mm. you don't know that you've got yourself in a position to attain that, that opportunity. But I think mm. what most people will be struck by was the, the amazing journey that you've taken. Thank you. To, to be here. Nore re te kamanatiamara. Does that sit comfortably with you, by the way, that title now? It's three years in. It's a role. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think um, uh, Dame Sylvia, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me telling you this, who I think is absolutely wonderful. Amazing woman, Dame yeah. Sylvia Cartwright said that she had had enough Your Excellencies by the time she finished her term and she was glad to be out of it. Um, you know, I mean, you do get Your Excellency a lot. Yeah. But that's the nature of the office. Mm. It's a privilege. Mm. And it's an honour to be able to perform the duties of the Governor-General and to do it. And the fact that you tell me that people feel a sense of connection and pride makes me so happy. Mm. Because, you know, the thing that would, I would hate is to do a bad job and for people to feel that that oh, was a reflection I, I on them. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> I think you're doing okay. But in the Your Excellency, yes, it's the mana of the role, yes. but it's also reflective of the mana of the person. I think the office has found its way to a very good person. Oh, the At the risk of making you hoha, Your Excellency. <laughs> Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, Julian. Ngā mihi nui kia koe.